Okay, I think I'm going to uh, start so people people can then uh, keep coming in as I'm introducing the events, everything. It's okay? Great. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to another Environment in Asia event at the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, my name is Lin Zhang. Zhang Ling in Chinese way. I am an environmental and economic historian for pre-modern China. I'm teaching at Boston College. At the Felbank Center, I convened the research series Environment in Asia. So I am very glad to see many friends and uh, uh, many new friends to show up at this event. Um, I'm so inspired. So I would like to encourage you to keep following us. Um, we will have many new events coming up in the future. So if you are interested in environmental study, environmental issue explicitly related to China and more broadly related to East Asia, please follow our events. You can look for our events from the website of Felbank Centers for Chinese uh, Studies. All right. Um, so before I move on to introduce uh, today's events and our speakers, I would like to quickly remind you um, a, a, a new event, a forthcoming event for the Environment in Asia series. So on Friday, November 20th at noon, 12 p.m., we will host a panel to talk about the issue infectious diseases and the public, uh, public health management in China from both historical and anthropological perspectives. We're very lucky to be able to invite four awesome women scholars to join the panel. They are Nicole Barnes from Duke University, Mary Brazelton from the University of Cambridge, Miriam Gross from the University of Oklahoma. And I can tell actually Miriam is right now in our audience. <laughs> the fourth speaker will be Elena Wreski from the University of uh, Brandeis University. So um, November 20th, Friday at noon, infectious diseases and public health management in China. Please join us to hear what our four amazing women scholar can offer. So, all right, without further ado, let me introduce today's event. We are very fortunate to have two wonderful scholars of Chinese environmental studies to be with us. Yifei Li, um, right now is in the early morning in China. Thank you for joining us and Judith Shapiro. So let me quickly introduce them and also introduce our um, my co-host for tonight's event. So Professor Yifei Li is assistant professor of environmental studies at uh, uh, New, York, uh, New York University in Shanghai and also global network assistant professor at NYU. This year, uh, Yifei is a residential fellow, however, currently in Shanghai um, for the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society in Munich. Yifei's research concerns both the macro level implication of Chinese environmental governance for state society relations, marginalized po uh, populations, and the global ecological sustainability, as well as micro level bureaucratic processes of China's state interventions into the environmental realm. Professor Judith Shapiro is the director of the Masters in Natural Resources and a Sustainable Development for the School of International Service at, the, um, at American University. And she is also the chair of the Global Environmental Politics Program. Judith's research and the teaching focuses on global environmental politics and a policy, the environmental politics of Asia, and also Chinese politics under Mao. Among Judith's many books, Mao's, uh, Mao's War Against Nature, published by Cambridge University Press 2001, and China's Environmental Challenges, published by Polity in 2016, are the must read for students of Chinese environmental studies, including myself. So together, Yifei and Judy, 
uh, they've just uh, published a, a fantastic new book, which is called China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet. So um, you can tell I have my copy here. I just uh, finished reading. It's, a, it's awesome. So, um, so um, you'll check out. This is, uh, I learned a lot from this, uh, this book. Then we are very lucky to have a co-host today to join the conversation. Professor Arunab Ghosh is a historian of modern China. Um, his research and teaching interests um, lies in social and economic history, history of science and statecraft, transnational history, and also China Indian history. But at the same time, Professor Ghosh is also a um, moving into the realm of environmental studies. He's currently working on a very interesting project, which regards a history of a dam and a reservoir construction in 20th century China. So welcome, all three of you. So um, without further ado, I'm just gonna move, uh, uh, leave this uh, uh, platform to Ife and uh, Judy. So you have about 20 minutes to introduce your joint research. Let me quickly remind our audience. So we will uh, begin with a joint presentation by Ife and uh, Judy, and then Professor um, um, Arunab and I will run a short discussion conversation with them and then we will open this event to our audience so if you have any question please type down your question in the Q&A box so Arunab and I will um, try our best to um, to convey your question to our speakers so please all right, thank you so much, Ling, for the very, very generous introduction. And thank you, Arunaba, for serving as our moderator today. It's such a great honor to be on the same panel um, with all of you. Um, today, we wanted to talk about our um, research on authoritarian environmentalism, or just in general, the kind of coercive measures that China has taken uh, in the name of environmental protection at home and overseas. Um, we wanted to focus a little bit on our book, but uh, the seminar is by no means just about the book. Um, it's about uh, sort of various kinds of observations that we're making, many of which did go uh, into the book. Um, but Judy, do you want to uh, start by uh, telling the audience a little bit about um, ourselves and how we came together in writing this book? So I, wa I wanted to start with this image. <laughs> I don't know if you know who that is. Do you? Haven't changed a bit, have I? Um, actually, what I really wanted to start with is to say that um, speaking at the Fairbank Center is always special for me. This is not the first time for me. Um, and when I was about the age of this girl getting her hair pigtailed so she would blend in a little better, um, I was already good friends with Holly Fairbank. Um, Holly and I had, um, been to Andover summer session together. Then we went to Woodstock together and then we became dancers together. And because of Holly, I knew John and Wilma pretty well. So um, speaking here feels very intimate to me. I like this picture because you know, it shows that I've been involved with China for a long time. So that's um, what I have to say about that picture. <laughs> and now little um, Ife. Okay, well, basically I grew up in China. Uh, I grew up in Shanghai. Um, the picture to the right is the house in which I grew up. That's on the intersection of Nanjing Road and Hunan Road right there in downtown Shanghai. Um, both of these pictures are really just to show that uh, Judy and I have been uh, thinking about and living in China for a very long period of time. Um, and we're fortunate to be able to come in together to write this book. And we wanted to share with the audience some of our observations that really motivated us to write this book together. And for me, it's really the observations about um, how there, are, uh, there seems to be an awful lot of foreign admiration for this idea of ecological civilization. The idea that democracies seem uh, to have been not terribly effective in producing good responses to climate change in particular and environmental challenges in general. And because of the frustration with the ineffectual democratic responses to our environmental challenges, many people seem to be speculating that uh, authoritarian responses 
to environmental uh, catastrophes may be warranted. Um, every time I hear these um, comments and these observations, I just begin to question them because they don't seem to be premised on a very solid empirical understanding of what actually goes on in one of the most durable authoritarian political contexts in China when it comes to environmental protection. And I think it's just very, very important that before we entertain any speculations about this whole idea of quote unquote authoritarian environmentalism, we actually have a full systematic understanding of how it looks like on the ground. Um, but Judy would like to talk about another impetus for writing this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in addition to the feeling that we have that maybe democracies are not up to the job of, um, of dealing with our planetary challenges, and yet um, the authoritarian solution is not the best one, I want to go back to um, the, the sense that I've had over a few decades now hearing about ecological migration. And on the surface of it, you know, ecological migration sounds really um, uh, inspired. You know, it sounds like people in coastal in coastal areas are not rebuilding after hurricanes because they realize that the sea levels are rising or something like that. But as this audience knows well, ecological migration is actually a way for the state to sedentarize nomads and um, to achieve its goals in pacifying the border areas. And it makes it that much harder than for nomads to resist this kind of sedentarization if it's done in the name of environmental protection of the grasslands because your little hooved animals are tearing up the grasslands together with those pikas who are um, also making holes in the grasslands. So um, yeah, so this is an overview of the book. This is actually our table of contents. Um, and I wanted to say, give you a very fast overview of what we did in the book. Um, we focused initially on the more developed eastern areas. We moved into the border borderlands. We went out on the state um, on the Green Belt and Road, and then we went into outer space. And for each of these um, spatial um, regions, we identified certain tools that the state tends to like to use in order to achieve its environmental goals. So um, we're going to give you a couple of examples of these, not all of them. But um, for example, um, campaigns and crackdowns, you know, there'll be a campaign all of a sudden to have like a, a blue sky, or there'll be a campaign to try to achieve a certain kind of pollution target. Um, and um, there'll be targets that are set that are very, very strict. And just to give you an example of how this can go awry, come one of my favorite examples from the book is um, in Henan last summer, um, they were trying to meet a certain kind of pollution target and there were artificial spikes in the pollution readings whenever the farmers turned on their grain threshing machines. And as a result, the local leadership forbade the farmers from using these threshing machines. And of course, the farmers ended up losing their whole summer crop. So that's just one type of example. Um, in chapter two there, we can mention green grabbing as a form of um, um, impetus for more dam, dam building. So in the name of um, renewable energy, in the name of um, needing to achieve certain kinds of uh, targets for hydropower, um, the state is, it makes it that much harder for people who are being dispossessed or dislocated because of dams to resist. Um, yeah, and I think Ife is going to give some examples as well. Thanks, Judy. Yes. Um, I wanted to talk about one of the examples which we covered in the book that's about recycling uh, in Shanghai, the city I'm, I'm currently in right now. Um, recycling certainly is something that has tremendous environmental merits, um, but when it comes to recycling, particularly how it was implemented and, and pursued in the city of Shanghai, we wanted to point out in the book that there are a number of notable features about the recycling program that came into effect last summer here in Shanghai. First is that um, it, it became such a major intervention that everybody in the city of Shanghai was talking about starting from last summer because the city imposed a very strict window of opportunity, essentially, for everybody to dispose of trash between the hours of 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning and 6 p.m. to 8 in the afternoon. So everybody can only dispose of trash within these four hours every day. And as you can see on this picture, 
Um, people sometimes can't make it back home before six, uh, before 8 p.m. at night. What do, what do they do? They throw away trash right next to the garbage bin as opposed to in the garbage collection center. And each residential compound, which however big or small it is, is limited to having only one garbage collection centers regardless of how many they used to have. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that before the implementation of this recycling mandate in Shanghai, it wasn't like there was no recycling going on in the city at all. In fact, on the contrary, there was an awful lot of recycling, as you can see on this right-hand side image. Um, these mom and pop operations on these flatbed tricycles, they move around the city to collect all kinds of recyclables that they could gather. Um, and that basically was their primary source of income for many of these migrant households living on the margins of the society in Shanghai. And yet, since the introduction of this new recycling mandate, the government has tried to formalize all of these um, recycling activities to, to be placed under the arms of Shanghai local government to such an extent that these mom and pop operations basically are pushed outside of the city. They don't have a means of income and, and means of livelihood anymore. Um, we don't see nearly as many of these, of these tricycles anymore. And in, even the ones that you do see today on the streets of Shanghai are either contracted by a certain local government agency or that they in fact work directly for one of the government agencies. So this intervention, once again, the environmental merits of the intervention, notwithstanding, we argue that the enforcement and implementation of it has, has had a lot of draconian impacts on how people conduct their everyday lives, how the Chinese society and economy are organized in the environmental footprint of um, these enterprises. Um, we've got a many, many other uh, examples, both domestically and internationally along these different lines. Um, but we uh, wanted the reader uh, of the book and perhaps the discussion um, in today's seminar as well um, to be able to consider two conclusions um, that we're making. But Judy, do you want to uh, begin by talking about this formulation of authoritarian environmentalism or environmental authoritarianism? Yeah. Actually, I want to give you fake credit for this uh, insight. But um, you know, a lot of times people say that they're that the Chinese state is using authoritarian means to achieve environmental goals. But through the work on this book, we discovered that more often than not, the state is using environmental justifications or excuses to achieve authoritarian goals. And that in so many ways, they're in the wrapping the wrapping these state mandates in the cloak of green is, um, if anything, intensifying state control over ordinary people. Um, so this is very troubling. And it's quite interesting to think about it in the context of, as I'm sure we'll talk about in the Q&A, the context of, say, the um, carbon neutral commitment by 2060. Um, or a whole other series of um, environmental promises. Also China on the green belt and road, you know, what are the implications of that? And um, China modifying the weather on the Tibetan plateau to make sure that it rains, you know? Right, indeed. And we also uh, discuss in the book a lot of interventions that the Chinese state has pursued outside of China, whether it's on the Belt and Road or into the global commons like Judy alluded to, or even in the US-China trade war, how environment actually also figured in the waste import ban. That does have, once again, a lot of environmental merits, but we actually question many of the non-environmental consequences of these interventions. And the reason why we're suggesting that it's more like using environmental means to justify authoritarianism or authoritarian rule, as opposed to the speculation of using authoritarian approaches for an environmental end is because in many of the cases um, that we document in the book, there, there are questionable environmental gains. Um, the, the pursuit of uh, afforestation in Northern China, for example, in Inner Mongolia in particular, have very questionable environmental outcomes. And yet across the board, we're seeing that various kinds of Chinese state actors have gained more um, very substantial authoritarian leverage over its own citizens, its ethnic minorities, its partners on the Belt and Road, um, as well as the global commons. 
Um, another uh, conclusion that we would like to draw um, everybody's attention to is how um, we're in fact finding somewhat of a counterintuitive um, uh, result, which is that um, the success of China's brand of state-led environmentalism hinges not on the strong state, but on the contrary, it hinges on mechanisms that place state power in check. And once again, we admire and we praise the Chinese state's decisiveness in pursuing many of the environmental interventions. But we also wanted to point out that the success of these decisive moves um, is premised on a broad base of support from journalists, from scientists, from filmmakers, from even student activists, from NGOs and all sorts of actors outside of this state. These non-stake mechanisms are pivotal in holding state power in check and thus in producing effective outcomes in environmental governance. So that's um, uh, what Judy and I have in terms of an opening presentation to orient everybody to uh, our, our research agenda. Yeah. Actually, and, and there's one I more just... thing, Ife, that we should talk about ecological civilization a little bit, I think. We, we skipped over that and that's so um, important. So why don't you- uh... Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. And, and, and yes, indeed, thank you, Judy, for pointing that out. And, and ecological civilization is also in the title of the talk. So it definitely is something we should talk about. Um, a lot of observers, um, at least the ones that I've talked to, um, seem to have the tendency to just dismiss ecological civilization as yet another um, Chinese propagandist's invention in, in the recent years. And that may well be true, but at the same time, I want to point out uh, two unique features with regard to ecological civilizations that, that I don't think should be just swept under the rug so easily. One is that uh, ecological civilization represents a very, very major uh, intervention on the part of Chinese Marxism. It's what many of the scholars in Chinese party schools are pointing out that, that seems to be something that they're very proud of, is a unique intellectual contribution of Chinese Marxists to Karl Marx's stages of development theory. Um, these scholars are suggesting that, you know, Marx basically described the evolution of societies from agricultural to imperialism, uh, to capitalism, and then socialism, ultimately to communism. But Chinese Marxists are pointing out that in China's transition from uh, socialism of Chinese uh, characteristics to communism, there is this middle stage of ecological civilization. They, they are arguing very, very vigorously that this ecological civilization is a transitional stage that quote unquote China is experiencing. And at the same time, uh, by virtue of China's experience, it's contributing to refinement and even advancement of the classic Marxian formulation. So that's why it's just such an important uh, intellectual in innovation, quote unquote, uh, to Chinese state-backed thinkers. And two is that China is, is very fixated on this idea of a century of humiliation uh, since the Opium War and all the way till this, the end of the Second World War. Um, and, and the argument being that prior uh, to, to the arrival of the British Imperial Forces, China was a glorious civilizational presence on the planet. And yet because of the British intervention, China fell into this state of, of, of messiness. And in, in the, the Chinese Communist Party very much sees itself as an actor that has the capacity to quote unquote, rejuvenate the Chinese nation. In other words, to bring back the former glory. Now, this is why ecological civilization is so important because Chinese state ideolo ideological thinkers are saying that China isn't just gonna come back as just any random form of civilization but it's a very particular kind of civilizational leader that is ecological in quality. Um, so ecological civilization, in, in other words, ties into an awful lot of intellectual and ideological baggage on the part of the Chinese state to such a point that uh, we just don't think it, it, it should be something that we, we, we can just dismiss out of hand. Mm -hmm. Thank but you, Ife. 
and uh, Judy for this uh, wonderful uh, opening. So this gave, uh, gave us an overview of your joint research. So now let's uh, turn to our uh, um, first round of a discussion. So how about uh, we um, turn to our lab to lead our discussion and uh, I will see how I can pop in to contribute my few uh, two cents. Great, thank, thank you, Ling. And uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here, delighted to meet uh, Judy, and of course to see Fei again, uh, and uh, really, really impressed by the book. Uh, I have to congratulate you guys. It was, I think, both uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking in equal measure. So it's been, it's it, part of my attention is going to be how to how to sort of uh, discipline the different kinds of questions I have so that they make sense uh, both to you and then to our audience. Um, but I thought maybe we could start off by uh, by talking a little bit, um, picking up on some of the threads that uh, that you ended on with with uh, with Ife. Um, but but in, but in order to do that, maybe I should point out to our audience that one of the things you do in the book is you say that the book is in three registers. You know, you're talking about sort of the a sort of you trace a historical evolution, uh, you talk about then a contemporary moment, and then you talk prospectively about what what is sort of going on, uh, what what are the possibilities uh, looking ahead. And in the uh, in your historical sort of uh, what what you trace historically, you talk essentially about the systematization. Uh, of the exercise of, of authoritarianism and that and then and, and the role the environment has played in that. Uh, and I, I wanted to link that to the, the discussion that you just had about eco ecological civilization, wherein the framing really seems to be that this is something special and exceptional to China, both as a theoretical contribution, but also as something that China is now experiencing. It's in this stage and then it's going to make innovations. So sort of the question that emerges then is if is this something that is China's alone, or is this something that's much more universal? And how do we think about that in a contemporary context, uh, but also since both Ling and I are historians, uh, when we were talking about this earlier in the week, we're thinking about sort of other earlier historical moments where you can think of similar kinds of crises and then similar kind or, or and a response that might be interesting to think about. I, 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 have, I have one obvious one that comes to mind, of course, which is the population bomb and Paul Ehrlich and you know all of the, the discussion around that. But I'm a modern modern historian, so I only think only about the 20th century. Ling was when Ling responded, Ling responded by saying, "Well, she was thinking about a much longer durée." Uh, so I don't know if you want to provide you know yeah. add anything to this Ling, but I, I was mm -hmm. yeah wondering what your thoughts were on this question. Yeah, thank you so much, Arunapa, for bringing up this historical dimension. So interesting, uh, interestingly, in the past few days, I was just revising an old article by myself, and uh, it was painful. But it's interesting, you know, as I'm reading your book, and I'm writing my own thing, and I realize how actually I'm writing sort of environmental authoritarianism as well. But I was a dealing with something a thousand years ago, right? So it would be wonderful to hear from you. So in, in a sense, you see applic uh, up applicability of the concept and then the way of thinking for other kind of historical framework, or have you encountered any other studies, right? To, to say they're actually, this is unique and it's also unique to this particular circumstances of China in the supposed socialist circumstances, right? I like to say, you know, ironically, I've written another book a while ago called Mao's War Against Nature, which in some ways chronicles the authoritarianism of that period's destruction of nature. So it's quite the reverse. It's not um, at all um, positive example. Um, when you were talking, um, Arunab, yeah, I was thinking more about how as a globe, as a planet, there's a lot of search for another paradigm because we've messed it up. And so a little bit unlike Ife, sometimes the way I see ecological civilization is that I see some Westerners misunderstanding the phrase and getting super excited about it. It sounds like, you know, as China suddenly become Bhutan or, you know, everybody's hugging trees or something like that. And it's that misunderstanding because it sounds so good um, that, um, you know, I would think, wouldn't it be wonderful if America could put ecological civilization into its constitution the way Xi Jinping has done for China? But, um, you know, when we unpack and see what ecological civilization implies and all the sort of jingoism that goes along with it and the reassertion of uh, Chinese superiority, it has quite a different flavor. So I think we're trying to um, get some corrective to that. Um, Ife, you have some? Yeah, um, my mind is still on uh, the first part of Arunaba's question. 
about how uniquely Chinese is the story, right? Um, I think in a book we pointed out a number of um, cases in which, you know, uh, we wanted to say that the World Bank or some of the other international development agencies have been pursuing very similar approaches of, you know, development without consultation or development with token participation from the bottom. And, and in, in that sense, China merely adopted the same playbook that has characterized many, many decades of international development and even domestic development. So in that sense, it's not new. What seems to be new in uh, what we're documenting is, um, first of all, the Chinese state is, is not even apologetic about many of the side effects of um, environmental governance, you know, when, whenever they um, force these uh, ethnic minority groups to resettle, these nomadic groups to, to resettle, they, they try to impose this discourse of, uh, of urbanization being self-evidently good or sedentarization being self-evidently good, that development as the Chinese state sees it is self-evidently good. So that discourse is so overpowering and unapologetic in that level of a, a sort of imposition seems to be rather unprecedented. But there seems to be another aspect of it, which I think is more interesting, is the Chinese state's dependence on technocratic tools in pursuing many of these changes. Um, technocratic tools that are used not only in China, uh, in monitoring citizens, in pursuing um, all kinds of, of technological advances, dams, uh, and what have you, but also internationally on the Belt and Road. Uh, China seems to have a ready audience, a ready market that is not only in the want of these kind of technocratic controls, but also uh, in, in they're, they're hungry for the kind of tours. I mean, this year, because of the pandemic, I was, stra I was stranded in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab um, Emirates um, for a very long time. And right there, I saw um, a lot of Chinese technologies, whether it's um, the QR code based um, phone apps that enable government authorities to track people's movements or um, surveillance cameras, facial recognition surveillance cameras, once again, in the name of order, in the name of environmental management, um, has a, a very uh, hungry market right there uh, in the UAE and certainly not just limited you into uh, the UAE. So, so I think those are, are sort of, I, I, you could say maybe it's just a matter of degree, but I also think that uh, China's pursuit um, in fact, it seems to be qualitatively different in many areas. So that, that, that's 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 really fascinating, and I want to come back to uh, to this this idea of the you know the solutions that are being offered, the, the nature of technocracy, and and how it's being exported. But but before that, just a sort of follow up question, uh, because you talked about you know when you when you trace sort of different mo models of authoritarian, if you if we use the you know political science terminology, the authoritarian resilience, you had. The Andy Nathan, you know, one, if you call it 1.0, then you then you, you you mentioned both of these. You talked about Andy Murtha's authoritarian re resilience 2.0 as well, uh, and then you, you one of the main arguments that you that you highlighted in the in your presentation right now was was the need for checks in some ways, right? That it doesn't really work in the absence of checks. But we seem to also have entered a, a period when the checks really aren't are no longer present. Uh, so do you do you think then this is constitutive? Is this authoritarian resilience? To use another, you know, to throw another sort of moniker onto this period, authoritarian resilience 3.0 in some ways, and it harkens back to, you know, maybe maybe 2017 marks the end of, uh, you know, end of the reform era. That's not, that was there was some conversation along those lines also, right? So, if would you say that this is this is a new era altogether in some ways? I maybe Judy uh, has a, has different ideas on this, but in my view, I, I don't I don't think we are entering an area that, that, that warrants a new label that, that is qualitatively different from anything in the past. But one of the things that we really wanna pay attention to is that in documenting Chinese environmental governance, we, we aren't just writing about failures by no means. Uh, in the book, we also try to be careful about documenting successes and we wanna understand why they succeeded, right? Um, so in, in suggesting that we needed these mechanisms that can place state power in check, um, the basis of that suggestion is precisely these success stories that we documented in the book, whether it's the rehabilitation of the Lowe's Plateau, which I think uh, this audience probably is familiar with, but for those of you who, who aren't, 
Um, it's, a, it's a story in which a, a group, a very diverse group of intellectuals and government officials and scientists came together to study the Los Plateau for two years without any intervention. It was just a two year fact finding mission in which economists and scientists and ecologists and government officials came together just to understand what was going on in terms of the livelihood choices, in terms of people's collective memory of the past, um, almost an oral history kind of intervention just to study the people. Um, after that two year fact finding mission, um, this interdisciplinary group of scientists put together a proposal which the government endorsed and pursued, um, which really what was the reason that led to the initial success of the Los Plateau rehabilitation. But then the government in its haste to quote unquote replicate or scale up that initial success, they wanted to just pursue one element of that proposal, which was planting trees. And they didn't understand why planting trees or planting what kind of trees to suit the local ecological condition and people's livelihood choices. In the end, they pursued monocultural forests. They planted the same kind of tree. And in that initial phase, they planted an awful lot of poplar trees that uh, grew up very quickly, formed forests very quickly, but because these poplar trees have very deep root systems, they ended up sucking up so much underground water and uh, thus um, intensifying desertification. And, and we wanted to use that story um, to, to quite simply to illustrate how important it is for the state to fully sensitize itself to these various kinds of inputs from society, which produced the initial success. And in the second stage of that project, because they tuned out um, from these various inputs, they pursued something that they thought could work, um, but it didn't. And it created so much ecological damage um, that that simply is, is something that was very, very unfortunate. I would add that even though the space for environmental activism has shrunk under Xi Jinping, and it's certainly harder for foreign NGOs to operate, um, and domestic NGOs have to be very careful, um, it's not as if the space has disappeared. It's a question of um, civil society groups partnering with the right kinds of authorities within the state. And, um, and in some ways, the civil society groups can be the eyes and ears of the state. So um, another example of sort of supervision from below or citizen science or citizen engagement is this Black and Smelly Waters app which I love the name, right? So if you have this black and smelly waters app on your phone and you see some black and smelly waters, you can take a picture, you can put your own GPS coordinates into it, you can upload it, and then the government can come and investigate. You know, so this kind of um, cooperation, you know, it's not as if it's like some kind of multi-party democracy at all, but it, it involves a kind of, um, uh, an unleashing of um, what really is old school Maoism, right? It has to do with more trust in the masses and less mistrust, which has been more the pattern recently. Can I quickly actually interrupt a little because um, I can see um, in the Q&A section, actually Professor uh, President Jed Dwara asked exactly related to the question, right? What's happening to the 10,000s of environmental NGOs that flourished on, until 2015? And I think Judy, you just answered this question to some extent, but I really actually wanted you to talk a little, just only a little bit more, this is related to environmental civil society. And then there's a certain special mechanism you just talked about the collaboration, but there's a collaboration only reach a certain limit, right? Certain point. So, and I think in this book, you talk about some very interesting cases. So when you were responding, the two of you were responding to um, non-China entities trying to say, hey, we have a funding here. We have sources here, what happens, right? Can you just quickly say a little bit more here? Yeah, um, I, in another book or another article I wrote, um, you know, there's certain characteristics about this cooperation. Actually, let me start with start with a, like an anecdote. At one point, the Prince Klaus Fund, which is some prize in the Netherlands, they approached me secretly and they said, we're considering giving a prize, this prize to um, Madrin from the IPE, the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs. But some people on the committee are worried that he's not sufficiently independent of the Chinese state. I said, this is the wrong question for the Chinese context, right? 
for the Chinese context, it's does this person have the savvy to be able to achieve environmental goals despite the limitations of the Chinese state? You know, and how effective has, is this person? And this person is so effective because this person has taken government data, put it into an app, made it accessible, um, allowed the state to then achieve its environmental goals. Sometimes the environmental offenders are not out of Beijing. They may be middle level people, they may be lower level people, right? So sometimes um, the state needs that kind of um, freedom. Um, that kind of those kinds of eyes and ears. The state can't be any everywhere. So it's a very, very different model of civil society than we have in the US. Another time I was approached by, I think it was um, Oceana, one of these ocean groups. And they said, we're gonna go to China. We're gonna open up an office. We're gonna do campaigns. We're gonna be totally independent of the state. We're gonna mobilize people. I'm like, no, no, you're not. You know, you've got to find, you know, partners, whether at, at the university level or within, you know, some kind of um, state ocean management bureaucracy. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So that's just a very, very, very different model. And I still think there is space. You know, I still think there is space. Thank you. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to shift a little and ask uh, a question that I guess it's partly about how do we understand what constitutes a radical solution? And this is in some ways tied to sort of senses of temporality, how, you know, uh, the kinds of targets we set, what we want to achieve, whether it's that 2060 carbon neutrality or something else like that. Um, you know, so what, what sort of in, 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 in the ethnographic work that you have done, what sort of sensibility about what, what constitutes radicalness do you encounter? And I'm thinking of this as, as, as not just in terms of, um, so the environment has become a planetary crisis. Uh, so so that, that itself, I think, becomes an interesting question. At what scale is something radical or not? Uh, but I think in some ways, it, I'm interested because I think it applies to a, a political moment also, and in, in as much as what we have, we're seeing in the US right now, where there's a real sense of, of, of such a strong cleavage, uh, but also a, a tremendous desire to, to come up with quick solutions and, and sort of a quick fix in some ways. Uh, so I think it, this, this sensibility is perhaps, it, it's pervasive. It's not just limited to our sense of the environment. But I was wondering if you have any reflections on, on, on that. So the, the, this idea of radical quick fix solutions or radical solutions and, temp and how it relates to temporality. Right. Um, thanks, Runeba. Great question. Um, you know, it, I, I really agree with you that we need radical solutions. And, and, and for those of us who, who are in the field of environmental studies, I think there's a general consensus that this is the moment of what we call this all hands on deck moment. Right, we can't afford um, to lose any opportunities that we may have at this point to tackle all of the environmental challenges we have. So we need, in other words, all the help that we uh, can get. Um, and, and this is precisely an opportunity to actually challenge the kind of state-led uh, environmental uh, leadership that we're describing in China. Now, now you, might, you might think it's weird. I just said that we need all the help that we can get. Why is it that we don't want the Chinese state's help that we can get? Uh, the argument is that empirically, what we're documenting in China seems to be a situation in which the Chinese state doesn't just want leadership. The Chinese state wants monopoly to a point that it's pushing out many of the help that we can get. Um, we're, we're documenting situations like you know, the recycling story that I just shared with you all. Um, is a situation in which the Chinese state tried really, really hard, or at least the Shanghai local state here on the ground, tries so hard to formalize an entire sector to a point of marginalizing, if not completely excluding other actors from participating in environmental sustainability. And that's very much detrimental to the overall long-term durability of the planet's habitability for us as humans, because you know these mom and pop flat bad tricycle recyclers had a very real and urgent economic incentive to recycle as much as they can. And yet these newly hired or newly created government employees for recycling, they don't have an urgent economic incentive to do that. Um, and, and the same goes for many other areas of environmental intervention in which we see the Chinese government is saying that, okay, these independent journalists are quote unquote, insulting China. 
or these filmmakers are not telling China's story well, or not at least according to the specifications of the Chinese state, or some scientists, as we have seen uh, in the initial outbreak of COVID-19, they were saying that scientists, if you wanna publish a result of any of your studies on COVID, you have to get uh, a rubber stand approval from a higher level authority because your story may not be in line with what the government narrative happens to be for that moment. Um, and in all of these cases, we're seeing that the state not only dominating a field, but essentially domineering a field uh, in the sense that they really don't want voices to the contrary. And that's very bad for the environment because we really are at a moment where we cannot afford to lose any help that we can get. Now, let me just add, I don't think we use the word radical in the book at all. I don't no, think that's did. part of our, um, it never occurred to me, but, um, we do talk about these campaigns and the campaigns have been, you know, from the Mao period on and they've never been a good idea, right? All of a sudden, all hands on deck, let's do this. Let's like fill in this lake, you know, let's make grain fields where there didn't used to be grain fields, whatever it is. Um, or, you know, let's get the skies blue for the Olympics or for APEC or whatever. Um, and then the, the weak get caught up in the net and they suffer and then in the long run, it's not sustainable. You know, the, the goal that was supposed to be achieved is not achieved because the people are not on board and it's so focused on a target and it's, you know, what are they, killing the chicken to scare, scare the monkey kind of thing. So, yeah. Great. So, I mean, in some, this is, this is really fascinating because in some ways uh, underlying this, then one could argue is sort of this, this crisis of capital, capitalism that really is about growth. So if we, you know, if we set aside these, these sort of words that, that generate all kinds of anxieties amongst people, capitalism, socialism, and so on. The, the idea that there is a consistent sort of commitment to growth uh, is in some ways the engine for a lot of these crises. Uh, so do you, do you see any sort of possibility of uh, whether through uh, ecological civilization or other kinds of concepts, a, an attempt to reassess uh, that sort of fundamental given in some ways? Uh, so this, because it speaks to some of the things that you talked about in terms of re redistributive justice, but who, who sacrifices first in order to achieve some kind of, you know, more environmentally sort of sustainable future and so on. Do you, do you see that as part of the conversation at all anywhere uh, or is that really a pipe dream? Um, well, now that I am aware of, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I wish uh, that that becomes part of the, the political mainstream or at least part of the political discourse, even on the, on the margins, but, but no, that's, um, I, I don't think that's something, uh, to my knowledge, has, has happened yet. Um, but also just on the note of growth, I think uh, we need to pay attention to uh, the kind of economic growth imperative, not only in China, which certainly is very strong, particularly in this post-COVID recovery. We see that a very, very central part of China's post-COVID recovery plan is to in fact suspend environmental impact assessment, suspend a lot of the environmental rules for what they consider to be pillar industries in this economic recovery phase. Um, whether it's a six month exemption or even a full year exemption, we don't know, but it seems to be the case that many of these industries currently at this phase don't um, subject themselves to environmental um, monitoring anymore. Um, so that certainly is a very strong domestic economic growth incentive, but also internationally, we're seeing that a lot of the surplus of Chinese economic production being shifted overseas to, you know, co-fired co power plants in Sri Lanka uh, and deep water seaports in Djibouti. Um, and, and these um, sort of surpluses of Chinese economic growth overseas have very, very serious ecological consequences, whether it's damaging uh, the marine ecology of Djibouti or uh, whether it's producing more carbon emissions um, along the entire Belt and Road. Um, all of that uh, have not only short-term but also long-term um, ecological implications that, that we need to be paying very serious attention to. Yeah, and if I can add, so much of the Belt and Road is about this mega infrastructure, whether it is deep water ports, high-speed rail, highways, big dams, these all carve up habitat. There's a question in the Q&A about non-human beings. You know, China, because of this technocratic um, orientation, let's, you know, quantify the, the carbon, right? But no understanding of island biogeography, for example, and what it means to fragment a habitat and what it means then in terms of um, extinction rates and 
the possibility of these creatures to survive. I don't see that. It just occurred to me as I was listening to, to both of you that I think in the latest, the, the memo for the, the 14th five-year plan, uh, an actual GDP target has been dropped, which is sort of one of the big uh, big things that people are sort of worry, wondering about. But I don't, I, I, so it's, it's sort of a, a small thing, but one wonders if that's linked to environmental considerations or it's much more, the, you know, the more mundane drivers of, of uh, uh, the politics of legitimacy in some ways. I know we have a lot of questions and, and um, we probably should transfer to that to 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 that, that uh, section of the uh, the evening but maybe one final question that is much more contemporary about about sort of our, you know what's been happening over the past few days in the us and the likelihood that we're going to have um, a, a new president uh, uh, elect um, very soon uh, in in a recent uh, south china morning post uh, op-ed uh, you sort of concluded co-authored by the two of you you concluded uh, uh, that uh, one of the things that a new pre president biden might want to do is, is sort of revive uh, the kinds of things that Obama was doing, so the 2014 meeting with, with Xi Jinping and so on. So could you perhaps talk a little bit about what you see now that this seems more likely, what, uh, what kinds of things should immediately be done by the US, perhaps as one of the two major players on the global environmental scene, along with China? Well, maybe, I think that was my sense in the op-ed, and you know, maybe I'm naive, you know, because um, my students were all asking me, who do the Chinese want to have win? And um, I heard from some Chinese people that they really wanted Trump to win because they see Trump doing so much damage to US reputation, superpower status, and so on and so forth that we would continue to be in this chaotic situation which would allow China then to further its goals. But purely on a you know, climate change um, point of view, I think some people are saying it's gonna be more of a competition, but this is maybe my naivete, I'm seeing more of a potential for um, what we call environmental peacemaking, right? So US-China relations are so fraught on so many levels, but this is one area where they ought to be able to agree. Environment is often a kind of wedge issue where people can understand that they need to come together and that can be the basis then for, for dealing with a whole raft of other um, sorts of issues. So yeah, I think we should go back to 2014 Xi Jinping, Obama, you know, committing to um, trying to deal with climate change. If I could add to that, I, I completely agree with Judy. Definitely go back there, go back to that bilateral agreement. Uh, the United States rejoined the Paris Agreement and recommit itself to, to the kind of cuts that Obama administration committed to. Um, but at the same time, there's another aspect which I think um, has a lot more potential to get into which is that many of the discussions at this point has been about how the Biden presidency um, could potentially try and hold China accountable for many of its international pledges or even domestic pledges about carbon emission reductions, energy inten intensity pledges and various kinds of environmental goals. So hold China accountable to these environmental goals. But to me, that's just the first step. The second step is to see that, okay, if China indeed um, fulfills these goals to the greatest possible extent. And we have a third party verification mechanism to make sure that China, China has indeed accomplished these goals, but we need to be asking at what cost, both domestically and internationally, if achieving these goals mean that um, you know, Chinese citizens and China's Belt and Road uh, partner, trade partners um, be subject to even more centralized control of the Chinese state or internationally be subject to more geopolitical leverage on the part of China in, in placing its trade partners in an even more disadvantaged position. Then we need to be asking whether uh, achieving these environmental goals are equitable or even worth the while if achieving these goals mean that we are sacrificing so much individual liberty and um, global balance of power. Um, so, so that I think is, is a long-term conversation that has not yet happened yet, um, but it, it certainly should begin to figure uh, in international politics a lot more uh, prominently. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.
Uh, well, um, so I think we should open this up for a, uh, a Q&A, a broader Q&A, because we can see many questions come in. And I just want to quickly mention that since this, this last round of conversation about the changing political landscape in the United States, I meant to, but I forgot to thank all of you, both our speakers and also all the audience actually to show up at this particular hour to participate in this conversation. I know all of us have been living through this chaos days. So thank you for being here with us. I hope our event has been serving a wonderful distraction to you all. So we will look at the uh, questions. So how about uh, uh, let me pick up a first question first, and then I think Aruna, you can look through the list so we can mm -hmm. try to um, uh, go through as many questions as possible. So there's a question from our friend Michael Hathaway, and he's asking this question related to my own concern, I guess, part of because I'm a historian. So he, this question is more uh, more for Judy. So Michael said, um, yeah, uh, we all love your book, My, uh, Mao's War Against the Nature. So based on your new book here, Collaboration with Ife, do you have any divergent reflections on environmental dynamics during the Mao era? Would you write the same book now about the nature under Mao or have your views changed on that era? So in a sense, um, uh, what major parallels and divergence um, do you see with uh, the era under the Mao and the contemporary era? Thank you for reading my book. Um, I think the Mao's War Against Nature was so much based on field work and interviews and that book wrote itself. I wouldn't change a thing, right? Because those were the stories that people told me. That's what they experienced during that time. I think what was more challenging for me was um, like another book in between, which is um, China's Environmental Challenges, which was about the uh, sort of roots of environmental degradation today. And the fact that in Mao's War Against Nature, I was making this argument that the Mao period had caused all this environmental degradation. And yet as soon as the Mao period was over, the environmental degradation got a thousand times worse, right? So how was I going to you know, explain that, right? And so um, for me, what was interesting during the Mao period was almost um, the discourse of human conquest of nature, this oppositional kind of warlike imagery that was so dominant throughout that period. And now, you know, it's not so much, although in, in this recent book, we have a number of, you know, make war on pollution kinds of um, images. But um, I think that uh, the market, you know, capitalism, all of this kind of growth has been much more destructive for the environment in sort of absolute terms, maybe not in ideological terms as compared with the Mao period. I mean, during the Mao period, they didn't have all that packaging. You didn't see piles and piles of trash everywhere, you know, all of those kinds of things. And even though the water was highly contaminated, it wasn't black and stinky <laughs> in quite the same way. So um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I would definitely love to go back to China as it was in the 80s, just looking at the, in the Hunan countryside with those, that mix of palm trees and, um, and evergreens and the rice paddies. And, you know, that was a lovely scene, you know, it was a lovely scene and you don't, and so much has been lost. So I don't know, I guess Ife, you can't answer that question. It was, a, it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great. We have we have a question from uh, a namesake of yours, Ife, but Xing Sun Sun Ife, who's who uh, I think it's 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 useful because um, we didn't hear you talk much about sort of your methodology. Uh, so perhaps we could hear a little bit about how you went about. So the question is, uh, did you talk to governmental government officers about why they made the choices they made, uh, and was this Shanghai specific, or is there is there sort of a, a sort of more broader China picture that you can describe? And he had a second question about geographical variation. Which I think is is more straightforward because you covered that in the when you talked about the table of contents. But yeah, a little bit about the methodology in terms of how you went about. Right. Perhaps just just very quickly. Um, so so to this other Ife uh, Ife Sun in the audience, um, I, I think you know we we would like to think of the book as a collection of case studies at different levels that registers at different levels of analyses. So like Judy alluded to when we showed you the table of contents of the book, we begin with the industrial east east of the country, 
We then moved to the Western borderlands and then to the Belt and Road across the Eurasia continent and beyond, and then ultimately into the global commons and even outer space. So that's sort of the spatial organization of the book. We follow the Chinese state as it progresses, as it expands into the global commons. Um, in terms of the composition of each chapter, each chapter has um, a number of case studies, quite a few case studies in each of the chapters. Um, and, and, and for some of the cases, um, I, and Judy and I derive our, our descriptions from our own personal experiences. Um, in some of the cases, I took materials from my own dissertation fieldwork. I am an, an ethnographer of the Chinese state. I talk with Chinese state officials all the time. And, and it looks like this, this uh, Ife from the audience uh, might be interested in my second book. Uh, which is coming up uh, with the MIT Press, hopefully, uh, if everything goes as planned. That book, thank you, um, that book will have a, a much more detailed methodological discussion about how I come to gain the knowledge that I have about uh, these various officials and the bureaucratic decision-making processes um, that defines the apparatus of environmental governance. So uh, be on the lookout, perhaps, uh, that other Yifei, hope to be frank with you. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so can I follow up with a mm -hmm. question I think is slightly related here. So uh, we have a, a, um, um, a member here, Natalie Ballo. Um, well, Natalie says um, she really enjoyed this lecture as a wonderful distraction. Yay, we did it, it's wonderful. So they, um, Natalie says, I know you discuss a great deal about how NGO and environmental activists have increasingly limited and a narrow space to operate in China. Although Judy repeatedly emphasized that there is a space. So I am wondering in this case for scholars like yourself, if you also face increasing difficulty in researching publishing on Chinese environmental issues. And I think in the past several months, especially due to coronavirus, we've been hosting uh, many people, institution hosting research event to educate uh, ourselves and uh, graduate students on how to do research given all these constraints, right? So what's your experience? What's your solutions? Um, great, what a great question. I mean, and also, you know, my, my mind explodes when I hear questions like that because there are so many different levels of concerns that are registered um, al along these lines. Um, one is that research, whether we can even get to research access anymore. I alluded to, I'm an ethnographer of the Chinese state. I was actually granted unlimited access to one of the central Chinese government ministries in Beijing for a full year of ethnographic observation in their offices. I sat with these officials. I had full access to their archives and all the documents, even in their draft form. That was a level of access that I can't even imagine today. Um, it was also uh, towards the end of my uh, year-long observation in Beijing uh, that there was a, an internal government order that came down to, to the unit where I was working in that, uh, that began to, to actively discourage officials from using iPhones because of worries that Apple phones were more prone uh, to manipulation from uh, foreign actors or foreign institutions. Um, so, so there were a number of other things um, at that level, just, just because of access. But then I think uh, Natalie's questions uh, is also about how we talk about our research um, in China. Uh, this, this event is not the first event that Judy and I have been doing. We've also been uh, doing events with, with NYU Shanghai, uh, my own home institution. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we made it absolutely clear to the event organizers that we didn't want um, promotional materials to appear in Mandarin Chinese. We, want the, we wanted the event to be exclusively in English as a measure of precaution. Um, because we, simply because we didn't want people to misinterpret. You know, we don't want a situation where some member of the audience or, or maybe a member of the general public take a sentence in Chinese out of context and then begin to misinterpret what we mean in the book. Um, so that was something that we were trying to be very careful about, but also it's not just research, it's also teaching, right? Um, because of many of the uh, recent events, and, and we all know that there's the Hong Kong national security law, um, we wanted to be a little more careful in how we present our materials um, to our students and how our students access materials. And once again, um, before uh, the beginning of, of this uh, webinar, we were talking about uh, just, just in, our, in, in 
the group of four um, that we have here about how sort of NYU Shanghai exists in a bubble within China. Uh, and the real worry is that the bubble could burst, right? Um, to what extent can we protect our students? To what extent can we protect um, our faculty members in terms of academic freedom? Those are real questions. Now, Lee, unfortunately, I don't think I have a, a, a a sort of a, a definitive answer to many of the questions, but I, I guess the upshot is we try to be very careful in, in navigating the landscape. And for me, it's just about people to people ties, you know, people I've known for decades. Um, and so that's what's so sad about the status of US China relations now is you, know, you see these young people coming along who wanted to have the chance to go study in China or Chinese who wanted to have the chance to come study in the US and those ties are being broken. And so we're not getting that kind of um, mutual understanding. I think actually Chinese people and American people understand each other very easily, you know, on a people to people level. It's a, there's a natural fit. And so I, 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 I um, anyway, that my research, you know, it, it, it has to do with the people I know really. So always ask. If I could just add to that a, a personal anecdote that I think people will, will like hearing on that note. Um, my, my wife was a school teacher in uh, a public school district in Wisconsin. And a, a friend of hers from Wisconsin, an American friend who doesn't speak a word of Chinese, visited China while we were still in Wisconsin. And that guy visited my father-in-law, who by the way, doesn't speak a single word of English. And the two of them managed to have a dinner together for five hours. They drank so much and they became best friends. They kept talking about each other via us. And we felt, you know, that's precisely to Judy's um, point of how it's not so hard for the people of China and the United States to actually come together and understand each other and begin to have meaningful conversations and begin to even build very robust friendships. Um, and that level of connection, I think, is, is something that, that we definitely would love to see more of. Great. Uh, there's, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, there's been a few different questions that have tried to sort of address the, the legacy of the Mao era in different ways. But I'm going to read out uh, portions of Miriam Gross's question, because I think that uh, and sort of piggyback on that as a way of, of uh, asking you to maybe reflect on the legacies of, of, of the Mao era. So Miriam writes that uh, I found, uh, uh, so she's talking about the first conclusion about e ecological efforts that end up buttressing authoritarianism. And she says, I found a similar exploitation of public health to gain non-health political goals during the Mao era. For example, cooperative management of night soil in the name of controlling parasitic disease had negligible impact on the disease. However, it was very effective at forcing people into producers cooperatives because of, without access to fertilizer, they couldn't do solo farming. So disease management was also used as a mechanism to try to force settlement of previously uncontrollable migratory fisher folk. Uh, so do you think your observations are an evolution of these earlier stages or is this something that has been created anew? Um, or any other reflections you might have on sort of the legacies of the Mao era, broadly speaking? That's a really interesting <laughs> observation. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you, when you first, use the phrase legacy of the Mao era, to me, that has to do with the deal that the Chinese people made with the Communist Party of China after they become disillusioned under Mao. And basically they said, okay, as long as our living standards go up, we'll let you stay in power. And so that, you know, that's the whole story of how China became the manufacturing capital of the world and why we have such intense pollution um, but this willingness to um, not so much question authority, you know, at least that was the deal. And I think that that deal has been a dangerous deal, right? Because um, that kind of intellectual flourishing and freedom of the 80s before 89, um, you know, and then you go to a bookstore and it's all about um, how to get an MBA, right? So, and parents don't want their kids to go into these thinking fields, they want them to, you know, make money. Um, that whole way of thinking is, um, I think, supported the intensification of authoritarianism under Xi Jinping. I don't know if Yifei agrees with me or not. 
Yeah, um, I, I, I definitely agree on that note, but uh, I, I want to thank um, Marian, uh, Professor Marian Gross's question um, on, on that score. But I think, you know, if we could um, just think a little more broadly about whether um, side effects of policymaking or whether intended or unintended, um, whether foreseeable or unforeseeable, I, I just want to stress that these side effects are by no means unique to the kind of environmental policies that we're describing. If you think about zoning policies or nuisance laws in the United States, I mean, they have the manifest goal of creating an urban order, but they also have an implicit and, of, and, and oftentimes a very strong implicit goal of racial exclusion or socioeconomic exclusion or even segregation in many cases. So, so for, for a policy to have a set of manifest goals and a set of uh, sort of implicit and, 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 le and unstated goals, I don't, I don't think that's in any way unique to the circumstances that we're discussing. Um, so, so to your specific question about night soil management um, and disease control, uh, I, I, I think it, it's just a fascinating example of yet another instance um, but to your specific question about whether um, there's an evolution of these earlier strategies, I think um, you know the, the hard part um, I'm, I'm still trying to process is the level of intentionality, mm -hmm. whether these state actors actually observed earlier instances of these political gains out of whether it's public health management or environment, man, environmental management that they wanted to scale up these political gains um, through more interventions, I, I I don't know. I mean, um, I can't. I just honestly can't tell whether there is um, an element of intentionality in that. And yet, uh, that that sort of um, uh, level of unknowable uh, intentionality aside, I still think that what we're documenting is that these non-environmental consequences in Chinese environmental policies are becoming more and more systematic. Um, over time, and 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 I think it, it, that's just very clear. You know, we, Judy and I were just talking a, a, a few weeks ago about the use of facial recognition technologies in these trash collection centers in Beijing. That already is a thing. Um, there there has been news stories about um, how these facial recognition cameras can quote unquote catch people who aren't recycling properly. And that seems to be just an escalated level of gaining more citizen control um, through what seems like an environmental policy. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> so you'd better sort your trash carefully, right? <laughs> well, our speakers uh, graciously agreed to stay behind for a couple more minutes. So I wonder, Aruna, but how about we both pick a question so at least we can put in two questions so sure. to, to, to finish up. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead first. Go so I think uh, Professor Hiren, um, I, believe, I believe from University of Arizona, if um, I'm correct, um, Professor Hiren asked, how does your theoretical framework address non-human aspects of the environment, both inside and outside China? And uh, Aruna. <laughs> oh, should I ask it too now? Okay. Um, yeah, I think then we can wrap up maybe in a few minutes. Okay, so then I think mm -hmm. the one the one that sort of uh, we haven't really touched upon is from uh, uh, Myung-e Choi, who says, Thank, thanks for the presentation and the book. I am a human geographer working on environmentalism in South Korea and see a lot of com commonalities here. I have two questions. Uh, another and more prevalent trend in environmentalism is the market-led approach to it. Do you see the intersection of the market-led and the state-led approaches to environmentalism? For example, like state-sponsored or mandated payment for ecosystem services, ecotourism, and so on. And the second question is, to what extent do you think your argument on environmental authoritarianism can be applied to the countries in East Asia which have experienced similar authoritarian governments. Thank you. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as you see fit, I guess, or engage as you see fit. No, th these are these are all great. I guess uh, I'll try to be short. Okay, um, non-human aspect. Um, yes. Uh, we didn't really touch on non-human aspect in the book explicitly, but I think you know one of the things we ought to pay attention to is that the Chinese um, state actors that we document in the book seem very fixated on uh, imposing a Han ethnic majority ways of life 
on ethnic minorities. And that comes oftentimes at the cost of a lot of ethnic minority ways of life. And by implication, non-human actors figure even less prominently in that formula, right? So it's, it's not only a human-centric view of development, but it's an ethnic majority-centric view of development that's being imposed. So, so in that sense, I, I would think, yeah, I'm, I'm with you that we need a non-human aspect and non-human perspective, but we, we just um, are sort of very, very far from getting there um, at this point. Um, we do talk about non-human issues with respect to the wildlife trade though, is a kind of success story. So particularly with respect to the shark finning issue and on the way towards the success, maybe the um, ivory trade, um, and of course not so much pangolins and coronavirus. Um, but it's interesting that you saw our theoretical framework, because I think of us as having an argument rather than a theoretical framework, but I don't know, maybe we have a theoretical framework, yeah. And the South Korea thing is so interesting. Yeah. Um, I wish I knew South Korea better. Well, what about the sort of the broader question about sort of market-based versus sort of more state-led and mm. possible intersections? Do you see that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially in the context of the carbon neutrality pledge that came out, um, I want to say maybe three weeks ago, um, a, a very central mechanism for the Chinese state to uh, approach that goal is in fact the carbon cap and trade mechanism. So that perhaps is a great example of what uh, Professor Choi is suggesting in terms of the intersection of state-led approaches and market-led approaches. Um, what um, I think everybody should be beginning to be thinking about is the fact that uh, carbon is the fact of life on the planet. Everything we do produces carbon. Everything an organization does produces carbon. Um, if China, in order to achieve the carbon neutrality pledge, the Chinese government is now increasingly um, placing all economic activities under the accounting mechanisms of the carbon cap and trade um, markets all over China. Does that mean that everything that a company does or an organization or a university does will be subject to that level of accounting? And uh, accounting itself doesn't worry me. But wor what really worries me is the allocation of carbon credits through the cap and trade mechanism. Every organization, every group will be allocated a certain amount, but on what basis? Um, in, 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 it essentially gives the Chinese government sweeping power to, in, in allocating what activities are worthwhile in the Chinese economy. And that cap and, uh, that, that cap and trade mechanism um, has, has a real, real potential in becoming more of a draconian authoritarian tool than what it sounds like. I can see the time is at 8.22, already seven minutes behind our schedule. And I can tell there's so many other wonderful questions in the list. So unfortunately we cannot cover all the questions, but I will make sure to copy paste all the questions of yours and send them to Judy and Ife. And also, you know where they are. You can easily Google them to look them up, to, to look for their emails and get in touch with them. So Judy from American University, Yifei, currently NYU, Shanghai, so you can look them up, right? So um, I think we should thank our speakers, Yifei and Judy, and for participating and giving us a, such a thought-provoking and extremely very rich, informative uh, 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 conversation. And I thank you, Aruna, for channeling, following all these uh, thoughts and wonderful ideas and open the conversation up. And I really appreciate all of you for participating in this uh, event. Uh, let's uh, hope we will live through the rest of the night to get some good news <laughs> that can serve as stabilizer for the global political and uh, also environmental uh, stability. So um, everybody, audience, thank you for being here. Let me quickly remind you if you are, ha ha. <laughs>
<laughs> if you are interested in learning more about our events uh, at Felbank Center in regard to the uh, research series Environment in Asia, please uh, follow our, um, our website information. Our next event will be on Friday, November 20th at lunchtime. It will be about infectious disease and public health management in China, both from historical and, and anthropological perspectives. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, thank you. And I'm going to ask all of you to check out from the Zoom first. So that will leave us, um, the speakers, just one minute for us to wind down and uh, connect with each other for a minute. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Ling and Arunaba. Thank you for the great opportunity. Well, thank, thank you, you all I mean, for being people here. People are still here and haven't bought the book. They should go buy it. It's a fantastic book. It's, it's so. a really, a really wonderful <laughs> read. Thank you.